All right, let us begin um, our study today. It's, uh, again, we, we try to do a comprehensive study, and we do have to finish by about 10.25 because there's a baptism coming on, and we want to make sure, at 10.30, so we want to make sure that we begin and finish on time. And uh, let us therefore bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you that we can meet at this time to study your word. We invite your spirit to be with us and give us a word for our own hearts. To lift our spirits is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, this, uh, this for this uh, week, we're studying, um, we are studying um, Psalm 23. Uh, I think the whole, the whole, the whole quote is is really trying to answer, ask, ask one answer one question. What what question is that? What do you think we're dealing with this quarter? Why? What what's the theme? What do you think? Why? Where's all of these? There are different subjects coming all the way along, but it's a different theme. Oh, it's just one theme, different subjects. What do you think the theme might be? What's the question that they're asking? That they're trying to answer through these, uh, these this lessons. Well. I suppose one of the things is why do why do why do bad things happen to good people? That's really what this is about. Why do bad things happen to good people? How do we explain uh, the events that occur to us as, as as Christians, as people who are trying to serve the Lord, and still have a lot of these things, events, uh, things which can be sometimes viewed as negative, painful, uh, catastrophic. How can these events occur and we can still be children of God? So I think as I've looked through, I've perused the, 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 um, the 13 subjects, it seems to all be asking the same, try to answer the same question. Why do, why do bad things happen to good people? Mark you, that's probably, um, that's a false question. Why is that a false question? Why do bad things happen? People are asked that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? If God is there, God is real, God is omnipotent, God is supreme, why does he allow bad things happen to good people? What's the first thing that's wrong there with that question? Yes, why? well, bad things happen to bad people, bad things happen to good people. That's, that's, that's the second point. The first point is the presumption you're making is that people are good. That's a presumption. <laughs> but the Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. Not one. So, so the first thing that is probably incorrect is to assume that we're good. There is no, there's no one good. But then, of course, the, the, the other question that probably is, is more relevant, is more, um, uh, it's more a, a personal question is, why do good things happen to bad people? I think that's, a, that's, a, that's that to me, that's why bad things happen to bad people is okay. That's, that's the consequences of sin. Why do good things happen to bad people? We're all bad, but why do good things happen to bad people? But of course, in Christ, God has transformed us. But I think that really is the question. Why do, why do good things happen to bad people? But I think the presumption is probably not as correct. But let us look at Psalm 23. And it's talking about the, the shepherd's crucible. What happens? How do we explain why we are living in this shepherd's crucible? What's a crucible? A place where it's like a pot on top of a fire, right? It's a pot on top of a fire. It's where you burn things, where you purify things. The crucible, like crucible, is where you purify gold and silver. So the question is, how do we understand and explain the um, the crucible? And Psalm twenty three is one such answer and we try to go through it in a bit of detail but try and finish within the time so you know th that's a sort of, of sort of marjorie as it were some mock-up of what psalm 23 might be trying to tell us you know this the, the shepherd leads us in the path of righteousness through a, a valley but we are we are fearless we are protected from our enemies towards a glorious destination um, what is the destination of the shepherd? When the shepherd takes the sheep and leads them, where is he leading them? Yes, and, at the, and then eventually he leads them back home. You, you go to pasture and then you come back home. So the, the, the final destination is always going back home. He leads them back home to the, to the pen, to the place where they're kept for the night. 
So th that will be the sort of overall summary of it. So a few points I want to make. One is that the, the, the motif um, of the shepherd is bomb, found in both this Old and New Testament. The concept, the idea is existing both in the Old and the New. So let's take a few, a few, um, a few looks at some of these concepts of the Old and the New. The image of the shepherd. Um, the reason that, that God uses the shepherd is because we are so often behave like sheep. Is, you know, why does he use the shepherd concept? It's because many times we behave like sheep. Largely we behave sheep. And the thing about sheep is that sheep are spectacularly dumb. Now that's, so in other words, we talk about sheep, but, but in fact, it's, 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 it's somebody who's spectacularly dumb. Sheep are not very bright. You know, as you saw in the little picture there, they will, they will follow the leader off, off a cliff. They just keep walking off the cliff, you know. Um, so they're dependent, they're unintelligent, they're prone to wandering. They're not able to find their shepherd, even when the shepherd is right in sight. So I think the, the illustration of, of sheep and the need for a shepherd is accurate. Look at Isaiah 53 and verse 6. It says, we all like sheep have done what? Gone astray. And each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, Jesus himself. But the, the concept of the sheep is linked to the concept of the shepherd, that, that you need a shepherd because, of, because we are sheep, because we tend to go astray and wander. So, so that's why the image of the shepherd is, is come into play. Now, what would be some of the characteristics of a good shepherd? Obviously, they're not all good shepherds. Some are hirelings. But what's the characteristic of a good shepherd? Give me a few characteristics of a good shepherd that you could think of. What makes a shepherd a good one? We already said sheep are, are, are very wandering. They're dumb. They really need help and leadership. What are some of the characteristics of a good shepherd? Yes. Go ahead. No, no, go you first. He watches out, protects them. Very good. Protection. Yes. Yes, they're always there looking after them. Yes, looking after the sheep. Risk his life for the sheep. Yes. Anything else? They will risk. He knows where to carry them, to take them, to lead them. Yes. Anywhere else? I'm sorry? He knows where the good pastures are. Very good. So, anybody else? Anything else? All right. Let's look at some of those things. So, um, the good shepherd focuses on his flock. Yes, as we said, that's where his focus is, providing for them, guiding them, and keeping them safe. That's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd provides nourishment and refreshment for the sheep. Do you agree? Provides food and he provides refreshment for the sheep. A good shepherd is sacrificial and would give up his own life for the sheep. So, so those are some features. There are a few, there are a few other things. Oh, look, this is one. And it starts, to, it starts to illustrate why um, Jesus spoke certain things. He says, I'm the door of the sheep. Now, many times we read the thing, I'm the door of the sheep, and you really, you really need to go back a little bit to how the shepherds would keep the sheep to understand what Jesus meant by the door of the sheep. So, so when the sheep were penned in, the shepherd himself would lie across the opening, becoming the door of the sheep. Are you seeing it now? So, so he is lying across the opening. Let me see if I give you a better picture of that. So he's lying actually across the opening of the of the sheepfold or the pen of the sheep, and um, you can see it now. So he's lying right at the door, so that the sheep can for the sheep to get out, they have to come through him, and that's why Jesus says, "I'm the door of the sheep." That's exactly what he's talking about. So he's right at the he's there, and 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 the message is that. The shepherd sacrifices his own comfort, his own sleep, in order to protect and, and, and to make sure that the, sh the sheep are safe. And that's what Jesus mentions, I'm the door of the sheep. You see, when you, when you read the Bible, you really need to go back. There's some limitations of, this, of, of the English version of the scripture because we tend to read it in English. And we tend to read it in our culture. So when you think door, you think of a door in front of you. Whereas when Jesus is on the door, it meant something to the people who were listening. They knew that a shepherd who, sta who sits and lies at the door is there to protect the sheep. So he's really saying, I'm there to protect the sheep. He's going to protect the sheep from, from people coming in and from the sheep leak, uh, going out and getting lost. So he, and, and at his own expense, you see, at his own expense. 
So that's what it is. That's what it means by the door of the sheep. That, that's really what it was referring to. And of course, if, uh, if the sheep goes lost, then the shepherd would go in search of the sheep. They go in search of the lost sheep. So these are all characteristics of a good shepherd. The, the, the shepherd, a good shepherd is personally and intimately involved with the sheep. Are you seeing that? He's intimately involved. He's not just a hireling. A hireling is, what's a hireling? Give me another word for a hireling. A hired hand or an employee. This, he's not an employee. This is, this is his sheep. It is his business. It is his, it is his uh, property. And he's involved with it personally. It's not, it's not a hand. He's not working at a hand breath or, 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 or two people off. He's directly involved with the sheep himself if he's a good shepherd. And of course, the, the sheep, because he's so intimately involved with the, with the sheep, the, the sheep know his voice. Now, that really has to do with what used to happen in those days with the shepherds. So you had a pen and quite often several, um, several shepherds would bring their sheep into the pen. If I looked for the night, that's how it would be done. Several shepherds would bring their sheep in. And what then would happen in the morning is that the, the, each shepherd would, would call the sheep and the sheep would know the voice of the shepherd. You have all of these sheep there in the pen and when each, each shepherd in turn will call the sheep and as the sheep hear it, they will follow the shepherd because they know his, his voice. They said it's not so much the voice of the shepherd, it's the tone of the shepherd. Isn't that an interesting idea as well? I did some research on how they picked that up. It's the tone of the shepherd because, you know, you, I could be saying, what I'm saying now, you could say, but my wife will make out my voice. She's actually making out my tone. Because I can listen to your tone, you can listen to my tone, your accent and so on. And you can listen to the tone of the person and know who it is, even if you didn't hear what he was saying. So what the sheep hear is the tone of the shepherd. So each shepherd would come and would call the sheep and the sheep would hear and understand the tone of the voice of the shepherd and would come out. Isn't that amazing? That's when Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and will follow me. That's what he's talking about. So you see a lot of scripture that we read. Unless you really go back and do a little bit of a search, you wouldn't really pick up where he was coming from. He's saying in the midst of a lot of people, when I make a call, my people hear me. Just like the sheep would hear the voice of, of the shepherd among many sheep, you will hear my voice among many people. And you will follow me, just as the sheep follows the shepherd. So, so those are characteristics of a good shepherd. Uh, I think I've one or two more that I, I sort of put together. Um, the shepherd provides guidance for the sheep because they, they, they by nature tend to stray and wander into danger. So he's there to provide guidance. They're very helpless. Um, not only that, the sheep are very nervous and fearful. The nature of a sheep is very nerve, nerve, nervous and fearful, but the good shepherd is equipped to protect the sheep. All of these are characteristics of a good shepherd um, that Jesus uses. He uses a rod and a staff. Now that's what it looks like, by the way. The rod is a, a relatively short club-like device that he would keep in his little belt. And the staff was a longer, uh, thinner uh, rod with a hook or crook at the top. So that, that's, that's what a rod and a staff, which we'll read about the rod and the staff. I thought you probably see it's, it's, not, it's two different pieces of equipment. The rod was like a club and it, it was used to ward off the wild animals or any robbers that would come to steal the sheep. That's what the rod is, that little club-like thing. And the staff was a long pole and he would use that to, to scare the scorpions, stick it into holes and snakes. So he would go before the sheep would, li would lie down to pasture and he would see all the holes and he would, he would poke the holes to make sure there are no scorpions or no snakes that would come out to harm the sheep. So, so when he says, a rod and your staff, they comfort me, that's what he's talking about. So it, it, the concept behind it is one, to, to protect, to ward off the, the dangerous animals and wild animals, things that attack you, and then the scorpion and the snakes to protect us. So, so those are the characteristics of a good shepherd. So now that we've introduced those ideas, it would make a lot more sense when we read Psalm 23. That makes sense? Everybody's clear on that? Now we've gotten the concept of what he's talking about as a shepherd. He's using that, we're using that background of a shepherd to, to, to explain or to understand Psalm 23. So let's go through Psalm 23 and see what the message of Psalm is. Well, first of all, it talks about the shepherd. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, which is verse one. Uh, I like the New International Version of it because that maybe communicates it a bit better. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack what? Nothing. That's, that's probably a nice version of it. It commutes, communicates what we're thinking. When God is our shepherd, we will lack nothing. 
That's a promise. That's a promise that God has made. We would lack nothing. Now, in the Eastern concept, uh, a king is a shepherd. King, a ruler, is a shepherd that takes or cares of shepherds for his, for his flock, his people. And the Lord is a shepherd to his people. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. Are you seeing it? You know, he would, just like a king would make sure that his, his, um, his subjects are well taken care of. Uh, and a, a shepherd would make sure his sheep are, are well taken up. The Lord will take care of his flock. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Wonderful, isn't it? Uh, so that's the thought behind the Lord is our shepherd. And he provides for us. And when the Lord is our shepherd, we lack nothing. Now, Zechariah 13 verse 7 speaks of the Messiah as the shepherd. And in this case, the Messiah is a shepherd that will be struck for the sheep. Why, why is he being struck for the sheep? Because he's there to protect the sheep. He's there to guard, and he will give his life for the sheep. So he says, uh, Zechariah 13, verse 7, Awake, O sword, against whom? My shepherd. You see, the sword is awoken before against my, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. So the shepherd is, is, is uh, of course, is Jesus who, was, who was, was struck in order to save the sheep. His life was given up for us. And that's the concept of the Lord is my shepherd. He was struck for, for his people. Here's another concept and idea as well. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Yes. So, so John 10 is Jesus' response to Psalm 23. You see? So Psalm 23, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the shepherd. I am the good shepherd of which you spoke. So it's a response. So that's the response. John 10 is a response to Psalm 23. And he calls himself the good shepherd. And he, he emphasizes his point. The good shepherd would give his life for his sheep. Look at Peter. Peter calls the, Jesus the shepherd and bishop of our souls. He's, you know, he's shepherd and bishop of our souls. For you were as sheep going astray. Same concept of the sheep that would go astray. But now you are now returned unto the, what? Shepherd and bishop of your souls. So he's called the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Concept of who the shepherd is. And here is, here is uh, 1 Peter 5, 4. He calls him the chief shepherd. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that fadeth not away. Isn't that wonderful? So we have lots of ideas of who the shepherd is, what the shepherd does, and how he's there to protect to God, to guide, and even to give up his life for his sheep. Yes. There are bad shepherds and good shepherds, yes. And in the Old Testament, um, God, God speaks of the, of the leaders of Israel as bad shepherds. They were meant to be Ezekiel, correct. Very correct, in the book of Ezekiel, also in the book of Zechariah. But in Ezekiel, he talks about the, about the, the leaders of Israel as being bad shepherds. God, remember, he's, he's the chief shepherd. He's not the only shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. Um, but God has given the work of leadership to shepherd the flock. You know? So Paul himself was speaking. He says, after my departure shall grievous wolves come among you, not sparing the flock. Uh, men of your own selves, of corrupt, with corrupt thinking, they will come and, and try to destroy the flock. So we are, the leaders have been placed as shepherds, but not all shepherds are good shepherds. Some are bad shepherds. And they lead God's people astray. And we have to pray that we would be a good shepherd, not a bad shepherd. So in Hebrews 13, 20, he's called the great shepherd of the sheep. So what does the, what does the shepherd do for us? What would a shepherd do for us? Let's just look at some ideas here. He protects us. Isaiah 40, we quoted that already. He takes care of us when we're weak. In Ezekiel 34, he knows us and he'll rescue us in our dark days. In Ezekiel 37, verse 24, he gives direction to live correctly. John 10, 11, he will give up his life for the sheep. John 10, 16, the shepherd brings us together. So all different things that the shepherd would do. I, I didn't go into the detail of the text because I want to cover some, some other things, but they all, that is the concept there. Yes, darling. He leads. He leads. Leads is always the. He's always looking. He's yeah. Well, he's always looking. He looks. He's always looking around. 
He keeps his eye on the sheep. He doesn't just walk, he doesn't just walk with his head straight. He's walking and looking around. Leadership also implies um, he's carrying in the right direction. It doesn't mean that he has to stand up in the front all the time. He can be in the front, he can be in the back, but he's always leading. He's always directing. Correct. Smaller, smaller flocks, yeah. So, you know, but he, he leads from the front, but he's all, the, 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 sh the sheep will follow him. But there are always some who would go astray, and if somebody were attacked, he would be there. So the shepherd sustains us. Psalm 23, verse 2. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I will lack nothing. Look at Psalm 23, verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. Look at the concept again. He leads me besides quiet waters or still waters, as opposed to a, a raging, a raging uh, torrent. He, you know, the, the, they have to drink if you put them in raging torrents that they lost. So he's a shepherd. He knows how to make us rest when we need it. Do you agree with that? Sometimes we need to rest, but we don't, we don't know that we need to rest. And sometimes God has to make us rest. Sometimes when we don't even know it, God says, you need rest. Come here apart and rest a while. Jesus says, you're working a little too hard. You need to rest now. I feel he's talking to me right now. Even if we don't know it ourselves, he says, we need to rest. But he not only tells us we need to rest, he, he, he provides a good place for us to rest. Do you, do you agree with that? He provides a place for rest, a place where there's a, an abundant supply of food. He leads us, not just leads us, but he leads us into green pastures. Place to rest for where there's abundant food and where there's also still water. Because he knows we need water and he will lead us into an abundant supply, a quiet place to rest, and a place where the waters are quiet or still, where, where we can drink and, and enjoy the, the refreshment that comes from God. He sustains us. So that's Psalm 23 verse 2. Only six verses. But each verse, I think, has something to tell us. Um, now, the sheep, will not, the sheep will not lie down easily. Now, if you're a shepherd, you would know uh, why. There are four, there are four conditions that, that you, you have to meet for the sheep to lie down. Anybody knows what those conditions might be? For a sheep to lie down, he's a very restless, uneasy, fearful creature. Yes, if there's danger, they will not lie down. Very good. Anything else? Food and water, correct. They need to know where the food and water is. If they're hungry, they will not lie down. Very good. Got two of the four. All right, let's go through them. They, are, they will not lie down if they're afraid. If, if they think that there are things around them that they, they're going to threaten them, they will not lie down. They are sociable animals. If there's friction among the sheep, they will not lie down. See? So if, they, if there's this sort of fighting going on, they just will not lie down because they're sociable animals. If they are parasites or flies or something that will trouble them, they will not lie down as well. And finally, if they're anxious because they don't have food or they're hungry, they will not lie down. So the, so, so the, the real the, the shepherd has to deal with the, the fear, the friction, the flies, and the famine in order for the sheep to lie down. Those are the conditions he has to meet. And those are the conditions that God meets for us. Would you say amen? He meets our fear, he deals with our confusion or agitation, things that bother us and our food to make sure that we are well taken care of or we will not rest. So the Lord is our shepherd. He leads us besides still water. Now, the, the message is that the Lord leads us uh, all the way. Now, look at Psalm 23, verse 3. We're in verse 3 now. What does it say there? He does what? He restores my soul. He does. He leads us again, isn't it? He leads us into the, me into the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So again, he's leading us. He's restoring us. So he rescues and, and, and restores our soul. Where's our soul? Why, why do we need rescuing? What's the problem we have? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We have gone into the iniquity and sin, and he has to rescue us from sin, bring us back into his righteousness. That's why you see righteousness together with rest, restoration. He restores us from iniquity, and he brings us back into the path of righteousness. So he rescues us, rescues us and restores us. And um, the, the, the point with that I think is relevant here is that a sheep doesn't know where the green pasture is or where the still waters lie. Do you agree? He doesn't know where it is. He doesn't have a sat nav. He doesn't have a drone telling him where to go. How does he, how does he find the, the, the still waters? How does he find the, the, the green pastures? He follows the shepherd. Do you see the point? He follows the shepherd. He doesn't know where it's going. He follows the shepherd. And that's really the message for us. That the, the Psalm 23 is a message for us. And I'm, trying, I'm, I'm hoping that we can extract those messages. 
that we don't need to know where the good places are. We don't need to know where the still water is. We just need to follow the shepherd. And if we follow the shepherd, he will carry us into the place of abundance. He will carry us into a place of rest. Instead of us agitating, trying to figure out where should I go? What should I do? Who should I talk to? Follow the shepherd. And the shepherd will lead you into the right path. Would you say amen to that? So we don't know, we don't know where the green pastures are. We don't know where the water is. We just need to follow the shepherd. And he will lead us into the right path. Now the Bible says he leads us into the path, the right part of the path, path of righteousness. Now, um, when, when we talk about the right path, does that mean that right path is always easy? Is the right path always easy? Yes or no? No, it can be a very difficult path. And that sometimes is where people are challenged because if I'm serving the Lord, why am I having all these problems? Why is there so much trouble in my life? Why are things falling apart? But, you know, whether the path is easy or not, it is still God's path if he's leading you. It's still God's righteous path. Because he's leading you to the right destination, which is his shepherd's home. He wants to get you home. Sometimes to get you home, he has to lead you through a very difficult path. Would you say amen to that? Not, not an easy one to think, but that's, that's really the mess. Remember, the question is, why does good things happen to bad people? Let me try to answer that question. Why do good things happen to bad people? It doesn't mean you're not on the right path. God can still be leading you if in his, in, in his faith, he's leading you on the right destination. Darling, beg pardon? I'm sorry, sweetie. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, both ways. Why does, but I'm saying, that's why we defined it before. Not, or none, of, none of us are good. Well, well, we're saying, why does bad thing happen to good people? But nobody's good. So it's really, a, it's, it's a question that really is, it's, it's a non-question because none of us are good. But I'm using it because that's how the question has been framed. But the point is, even though we're following the shepherd in the right path, doesn't mean that things would always be easy. You could still have a challenge in life. You could still have issues, problems in, in your life because God is leading you to the right destination. And that's just the path you need to take. So uh, the big thing really is that it's the right path as long as we're connected to the right person who is the shepherd himself. As long as we're connected to the right person, whatever comes upon you is the right thing. God is allowing that to happen for a reason. Do you agree with that? Yes or no? Very quiet. What do you think? So when we're going through difficult question, difficult times, the question we have to ask is, am I still connected to the shepherd? And if the answer is yes, I'm connected to the shepherd, then where, whatever you're going through is the path that God is choosing for you. So, so it's not predestination at all. It's just the leadership of God in your life. So where does God lead you? He leads you into the right path. And then the next thing he says is what? Yea, though I walk through the what? The valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see the rod and the staff concept coming up there. Two different things. Now, the question is, the Lord can be a shepherd. You can be grazing in green pastures. You can be positioned beside still waters. Because that's what he's saying. That's what he is. That, isn't that what he said? He said the Lord is leading him. He said he is by green pastures. He's positioned by still waters. He said his stall is restored. He is walking in the right path. And yet, still going through a valley. <laughs> You still have to encounter the valley, and really, that's the message of that's the message of Psalm twenty-three. So when all of this is happening, it doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. You could be the Lord could be a shepherd. You could be following green pastures. You could be in still waters. You could be restored. You could, you're in the path of righteousness, and still have to encounter a valley, because that's what He says. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So problems can come. So good things can happen to good people, and bad things can happen to good people in terms of the definition. Say, so, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, what, what David is exper ex exper experiencing is some sort of dark or fearful experience that he's going through. The valley of the shadow of death. Now, he didn't say he was dying. He just says he's passing through the valley of the shadow of death. So some sort of fearful, dark part of his life he's going through. Very dark, dark portion. Anybody ever went through a little dark period in your life? A period of time to figure out what is, what is going on here? And that dark portion David was going through, uh, he was in a valley, which means he felt he was hedged in on all sides. Are you seeing it? Nowhere to move. Nowhere to move. He's hedged in on all sides. He's in a valley. Mountains all around him. He says, though I'm walking through this, I'm hedged in, I'm surrounded, I'm not in the mountaintop, I'm not in a broad mellow, 
He is in the valley hedged in. That's what he's describing, walking through this valley. And he says, not death, but the shadow of death that's casting a fearful outline on David's path. In other words, when he says a shadow means what? When he says, you see, she sees a shadow of death, he means what? If God doesn't do something, what? I'm dead here. If God does not intervene, I'm going to lose my house. If God does not act, I will die from an illness. If God does not move, my husband or my wife would leave me or my children will, will succumb. That's what he's talking about. It's a shadow upon him and he's saying, look, God, you've got to act because there's a shadow in my life. It's a dark shadow that's, that's coming across his path Why? with the way he's walking. He's walking a good path and yet a shadow is coming across his path. Some, yes, darling. True. There's light is still there. You can't have a shadow without light. Very true. So the light of God is there, but the path the, the, across your path that you're walking, this righteous path, a shadow is being cast. And, and David, David acknowledges, he says, I'm, I'm going through a dark period in my life, I'm going through a dark period, dark season. And, uh, and what was facing him, he thought, was ultimate defeat or oncoming evil. Whatever it is, he says, I'm going through a very dark patch in my life. Have you ever been through a dark patch? Been through a dark patch in my life. And he just, you know, he says, look, you, it doesn't mean that God has left you. It doesn't mean you're not doing the right thing. It doesn't mean that you're sinning in life. It's just that sometimes bad things happen to good people. Things that are, that are there. But so we already explained that concept, but I'm using it illustratively. So the things that, about the valley, therefore, what can we conclude about the valley? Number one, the valleys are ordered by the Lord. If you are walking in step with the Lord, if the Lord is your shepherd, uh, and, and, and if the Lord is leading you in the green pastures by still waters in the right path, then, then, then that valley is ordered by the Lord. Th does that make sense to everybody? God has directed it. God has directed the steps. Now, you, you, everything I say, I should give you some evidence for. Look at Psalm 37, 23. For the steps of a good man are what? I didn't say that. That's what David said. Same David who wrote Psalm 23. I'm going through a dark patch in my life. And yet, yet David says the steps of a, of a good man, a man that is in Christ, is ordered by the Lord. God is ordering it. He's ordering it. doesn't mean that he wants it to happen. But he selects the valleys that we're going to pass through. He measures the valley that we're going to go through. And he controls the valley that we have to go under. You understand? So, in other words, the Lord will not allow you to be tempted above what? That which you are able to bear. But with, through the, not in the temptation, but through the temptation, provide a way of escape that you shall be able to bear it. So, so God selects the valley. Any valley that comes to you has been ordered by God. God, God says, look, I, I, I know you can go through it. I'm going to put you through it because I need you to see something there. He measures it, makes sure that it's not overburdening, not more than we can bear. And then he controls the valley. How long? So what, do, what, what, are, what are some of the things you can learn from a valley? Now you're going through this sort of period in your life, this sort of time of the shadow of death. Death is casting a shadow in your path. What are some of the things you can learn about a valley? Yes, trust in, trust in what? Good, yep, all right, anything else? Makes your faith grow, yes. Makes your faith grow, anything else? What can you learn from a valley? Well, number one, valleys will tell you who your friends are. You agree? The valley will tell you exactly who your friends are. You know, when you have lots of things and things are going well, you have lots of friends. You go through a little valley in your life, then all of a sudden you'll find out who your friends are. And quite often you, you, you can find them on, 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 on one hand. You probably knock off two or three fingers and, and probably left with the friends you really have. A valley will tell you who your friends really are. When you're going through that dark patch in your life, you know, the, the, the proverb is a friend in need. There's a friend indeed. Now, now, I think most people misinterpret that meaning to say that they think it's a friend that's need. No, it's when you are in need. It's a friend when you are in need is a friend indeed. A friend when you have abundance is not a, you can't test that friend. But when you are struggling, when you have those periods in your life when you have a need, the people who stick with you, those are your true friends. Sometimes you have friends that are called fair weather friends. You, you know, fair weather friends. They're a friend, they're a friend only when things are going well. But a little rough patch gets in your life and you have some need, you will determine who your friends are. That's what the purpose of the valley. The valley tells you who your friends are. The valley will tell you who you are. You know, I, I have reached a point where I never say I will never do anything. I'll never do that. <laughs> I, you would be surprised what you will do. 
when you're going through a valley, you'll be surprised. So I've never, I've never said I would never do that. There's nothing, hey, we'll do it. You'd be surprised. It tells you who you are. A valley will really reveal who you are, what's in the deep secrets of your heart. Because it will tell you what you do. And of course, the, the valley tells you who God is. You know, you, you, we would never, you know, there's a song. If we never had a problem, anybody knows what the song of that is? We would never know that God could solve them. It tells you who God is. Because God intervenes and acts to show you who he is. He's a God who solves problems. So the valley. So how should you respond to a valley? How should we respond to our valleys? That's a question, isn't it? So we're taking a detailed look at uh, Psalm 20. Oh yeah, we have some time. We're going good. How should we respond to our valleys? Any thought? Accept. Very good. Embrace it. Very good. We need to embrace the valley. And that's one of the problems we have. We reject the valley. No, if, if God is leading you into that valley, embrace it. There is something there that God wants you to learn. So we need to embrace the valley. So though I, uh, David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, though I walk through, and now look at it. He didn't say you run through it. You, 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 you notice that? He said when I'm walking, he says I'm walking calmly through it. Why, why God wants us to walk through the valley, not run through the valley? <laughs> Sorry? Because, because if you walk too quick, you will miss what God is trying to, learn, to teach you. He wants you to see something in the valley. You see? Uh, and so we don't need to quicken our pace or get alarmed or panic. Don't panic. God wants you to learn something in the valley. He wants you to walk through it. Because there's something he wants you to see. He wants you something to see and to learn. So he says, it's got, uh, David says, though I walk through the valley, not, not run through the valley. Walking also means you're moving forward. So wherever you are, Whatever your situation, when that dark shadow is casting, once you're moving, you're moving forward. Because you're walking in the path. Walking means you're going somewhere. Not in one spot. You're walking, you're moving somewhere. You're going somewhere. Because you're walking through the valley. And finally, of course, when you walk, you leave some people behind. Because not everybody could go with you where you're going. Do you agree? Not everybody could go with you where you're going. Sometimes you have to leave those people behind. You know, you need, to, you need to rise to a different plane, a different, a different level, a different, a different reality, a different realm. And some, not everybody could go with you. Sometimes some people you have to leave behind because you need to go somewhere where God is leading you. And not everybody could go with you. So walking means you're moving forward, means you're going somewhere. And sometimes you have to leave people behind because the Bible says we are more than conquerors. That's in Romans 8. We're more than conquerors. Anybody knows where that text comes from? It's, it's in the book of Romans, but do you know, know, do you know how I, Paul used that scripture? So the, Paul says we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us and so on. But the, the concept is from the, the concept is from the Roman, uh, the, the Olympics, the Greek Olympics that became part of the Roman Olympics. Like what well, we have the Olympics, the Olympiads, it's not new. That's part of the Roman or the Greek, Greek culture that became part of the Roman culture, the Roman culture of the Olympics. And there was one of these things where they had to, they had to go up a steep mountain. So they'd have to walk up or run up a steep mountain. Now, some people would, would give up when they're going up. Some people would reach almost to the top and they would fall and they would faint. But if you made it to the top of the mountain, they would raise your hand in celebration and say, you are a conqueror. That's the definition. Now, what they would do now is if you made it to the top of the mountain and you've been celebrated as a conqueror, you, you'd go back down the mountain and then they put a weight on you. They put weights on you. And then you have to climb up the mountain again. Now, some people would climb up, but they would give up because the weight was too, too much. Or some people would faint and fall. But if you made it to the top of the mountain with the weights on, they will raise your hand and say, you are more than a conqueror. That's what that's talking about. In other words, you're climbing up the mountain with weights on. That's what the Bible is talking about. Not that you have an easy life. But that as we're climbing up the mountain with weights on, God will give us the confidence and give us the power and the authority to be a more than conqueror. We made it to the top of the mountain with the weight on, with the problems there, with the challenges in our lives. We made it to the top of the mountain. And that's what he says, do I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil. Because we are more than conquerors in Christ. Well, if, you are, if, you are, if God is leading you, the valley is it's not, it's not from God. It's he allows you to go through it. 
It doesn't, once, that's what I said, once you're going through a, 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 a valley in your life, or you're, you're a shadow of death, you need to ask the question, am I still connected to the shepherd? As long as you're connected to the shepherd, then, then yes, that's the valley he's chosen for you to go through. The question is, am I connected? It's not what, you see, we ask the question about why is this happening to me, you're asking the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, am I connected to the shepherd? Once you answer that question, yes, I'm connected to the shepherd, then the, 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 the value you're going through is, is being chosen by God, is being ordered by him for a reason. So how should we respond to our values? He says, I will, first of all, you must walk through it. We said that, we walk through it because as we're walking through it, we're more than conquerors. So we're walking with the weight on it, but you're more than conquerors. He says, you, you will not be afraid of evil. I will fear no evil because when you're in the valley, we will not be afraid. In a fearful place, the presence of the shepherd will banish all fear of evil. We want, because you're in a fearful place doesn't mean that you have to be afraid. Because when you're with the shepherd, the shepherd banishes the fear. Look at 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us the spirit of what? Of fear, but of power, but of love and of a sound mind. So being in a fearful place doesn't mean that you have to be afraid. David says, though I'm walking through the valley, I am not afraid. I'm not afraid. But why is he not afraid? Why would he not be afraid? Correct. Now, there are 365 fear knots in the Bible. Now, even though it's quiet and most people don't know it, but there are 365 days in a year. <laughs> Which tells you that God has a fear knot for each day. For each day, God has a fear knot. You don't need to worry about the fear knots and say, well, I only have 10, so I have to keep them in spare for tomorrow. If every day you have a fear knot, God, God will provide for us. So there are 365 fear knots in the Bible. So um, how should we respond? It says, though I walk through the valley, uh, well, the point I wanted to make is we're going through it. He didn't say we're staying in it. He says we're going through it. In other words, uh, I'm going somewhere. You're going somewhere, not where I'm going to, it's not where I am, it's where I'm going to end up, because God is able. And look, look at Romans 8, 37. This is the one I quoted for you. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors, we're going through the valley as conquerors. And then, of course, in verse, uh, verses 1, now, here's an interesting, here's something uh, might be worth looking at. Um, when we look at the first three verses, when we're in the Greece, green pastures, the Bible says we are talking about God. He leads me. He directs me. He showers me and so on. But when we get into the valley, we start talking to God. Have you noticed that? Thou art with me. <laughs> you know? So when we, are, when we are having good times, when we when we in the mountaintop, we are, we, we are admiring and encouraging the leadership of God in our lives. But when we are... Um, but when we are in the valley, then we are talking to God himself. Thou art with me, your rod and your staff, you comfort me. Start talking to God now. So he goes ahead of us. The Bible says he leads me beside still waters. He leads me in the path of righteousness. When we're going through the valley, he's there with us. Are you seeing it? God doesn't leave us in the valley. He leads us in the mountaintops, but he's with us in the valley. Is everybody seeing that? He leads us when, when we're in the, in, in the green pastures. He leads us when we're in still waters. But when we're in the valley, he's with us. He's right there with us. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? Thou art with me. Are you seeing it now? Beautiful change in the psalm, isn't it? From the third person to the second. He's gone from the third person talking about the he to the, to the thou, to the you, the second person. You are with me. We have his presence, his protection, his power. And his promise when we go through the valley, he is with us. So, so we don't need to be afraid of the valley. God is with us. I will not be afraid for thou because thou because you are with me. Is everybody seeing that? It's a, good, it's a good word, isn't it? It's a good word. And then he talks about your rod and your staff. We talk about the purpose of the rod and the staff. They comfort me. They were instruments used to guide the sheep, but they were the, 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 the rod was used to the um, the rod was used to protect the sheep. The staff was to help guide, but the rod was to protect. Protect them from potential predators. Who, who, is, who is our enemy in the Christian concept today? Who, who is our enemy? The Bible says we wrestle not against what? Flesh and God, blood, but against principalities and powers, against uh, the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts in high places. Our enemy is a spiritual one, and God is there to protect us, to guide us, and you know what? Even to correct us even to correct us as well. So, 
We've gone through lots. Let's let's go through. What what, what blessing blessings in the presence of danger? We get blessings in the presence of danger. Look at it. Look at Psalm twenty-three, verse five. For you prepare. Now remember, he's going to the valley. He's in the presence of enemies. He says, "You prepare a table before me, where in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over." We are there are blessings in the presence of danger that God provides in Psalm twenty-three. What was what? What is it about a table and an oil and cup? Anybody has a concept? I have some images there. Why a table? Yes, yes. So what God is saying is that He does not eliminate the presence of the enemy, but because of the Spirit, He gives us a rich bounty in the midst of our enemies. While your enemies are talking about you, you're doing well. While your enemies saying bad things about you, you're being prosperous. While they're trying to pull you down, you're growing up. Because in the midst of your enemies, you will do well. That's what he says. I'll prepare a table, a magnificent banquet from a benevolent host, and he has the bounty to feed, power to protect. Even though we're surrounded by enemies, God will still make us prosperous. So that, that's the message of Psalm. We don't need to be afraid. In the presence of our enemies, when things are, you know, the bills are coming in and the criticism is there and, and, and the police is looking for you and, and your children are falling apart and your husband is, is, is gone crazy. In the midst of that, God says, I will give you an abundance. I'll give you an abundance. And then he says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Anybody knows why, why the anointing of your head with oil? Anybody knows what the significance of that is? Very good, very good. When you had dignitaries and honored guests, the host would anoint his head with oil when they entered the banquet in oil. It was mixed with oil and perfume. Now you understand what the woman did to Jesus. Remember the woman who came and broke the alabaster box? And what did Jesus, what did Jesus say when, when Simon started to criticize the lady? He says, when I entered into your home, you did not anoint my head with oil. Remember that? See, you didn't anoint it. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't anoint my... What he was really is using that Eastern concept. That when an honored guest is coming in, they'd wash their feet. The servant would wash his feet and then they would anoint them heads with oil. He says, I came here. You didn't do that. This woman has washed my feet with her tears and she has anointed my head with oil. That's where it's coming from. It's actually a Psalm 20. It's really a Psalm 23 concept. Interesting, isn't it? So the Bedouins, who were these travelers, their hospitality called for such a lavish response to a guest. They would anoint his head with oil, uh, really illustrating their lavishness, their goodness. They're really uh, being a good hostess to their guests. So they would anoint their heads with oils. It's wonderful, isn't it? And, and the Bible says that God will anoint. He's treating us as an honored guest. Are you seeing it? God, the Bible, David says, you are treating me like an honored guest. You are anointing my head with oil. And of course, they, they would seat the guests in the front where there was more food they could eat. God is really showing us how he will operate in abundance. He is doing it for us. He is anointing us. He is giving us the abundance. But then again, he closes off in Psalm 24, verse 6. And it says here that, that we have a, a glorious destination. Surely goodness and what? Mercy shall do what? Shall chase after me. Shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 14, I think it is. Was it Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to 14. You know, you look at what the message is there, the blessings that come from serving the Lord. You will be the head and not the tail. Remember that? You shall be above and not believe. You shall lend and not need to borrow. You know, but if you look at it, it says, these blessings shall, shall what? Follow thee, no, and then it says, and overtake thee. It says, yes, these blessings shall follow thee and overtake thee. Not just follow you, it will overtake you. It will give you more than you need. That's the concept he's bringing out here. Goodness and mercy shall follow me and it shall overtake me. It will be an abundant blessings for us. So God says a glorious destination is waiting. David, we're sure of two things. Sure of two things. What? Goodness and mercy. The word for mercy is the same word for steadfast love. Steadfast love as well. He says goodness and mercy or steadfast love will always follow or chase me. No need to worry. We don't need to be afraid. God's goodness, God's mercy will always follow us. Always follow us. There was a certainty of God's goodness in the presence of an enemy. God's unfailing love and God's certainty of his guidance to the end 
is not being questioned. David did not question that. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And number two, the second thing David was sure of, we have an everlasting home where the presence of God himself dwells. He says, I will dwell where? In the house of the Lord forever. Wonderful, isn't it? He says there's a destination in the house of the Lord um, where you will be forever. So, you know, the thing about this concept in the Old Testament, if somebody, a dignitary invited you for, for dinner at their table, it was a bond, not just a bond of mutual loyalty, it was a token of a covenant. When they invited you, when a king or some important person invited you to their home to eat, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a token of a bond or a covenant. It was saying to the guest that you're more than an acquaintance. He says, I have now given you a token. And in the case of, the, of God, God says, you, I will live with you forever. It is to live with you forever. That's really what this message is about. When he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord, he says, what's the next word? Forever. It's a token of a forever covenant that God makes with us. Psalm 23 is a covenant of eternity. That if, you, if your Lord is your shepherd, you will, we will dwell forever with him. It's a token of a covenant that cannot be broken. There is comfort, therefore, Paul says, let us therefore comfort one another with these words. Would you say amen to that? Let us comfort one another. Psalm 23 is a, is, is a psalm of comfort. Let us conclude um, the message for today. It's, it's from Charles Spurgeon. He was a, a, a great British um, preacher. While I am here, I will be a child at home with my God. The whole world shall be his house to me. When I ascend into the upper chamber, I shall not change my company, nor even change the house. I shall only go to dwell in the upper story of the house of the Lord forever. Which is a comment on um, Psalm 23, Charles Spurgeon. Wonderful, isn't it? We hope to come. And that's all we're going to be sharing on Psalm 23. That's it. I've gone through the entire psalm. Hopefully, we've gotten a message for our own hearts. Would you say amen? Psalm 23 is a good psalm. It's a psalm that we can, we can, we can read, we can read, we can repeat, we can, we, can, um, we can pray. But at least we're doing it now with the understanding. Would you say amen? You, you, want, to, you want to sing with the spirit, but you want to sing with the understanding. You want to pray in the spirit, but you want to pray with the understanding also. So when, you, when we read Psalm 23, now we can sing and we can pray with the understanding that God is with us. He will never leave nor forsake us, even though we're going to be, we will have to follow through some, for, uh, go through some dark valleys and, and some, some difficult places. God is with us and his house is our house forever. Let us close with our thoughts so we can continue on with our, our next scheduled event, which is the baptism. Father, again, we thank you for a word about Psalm 23 that we have learned so much about what the meaning of Psalm 23 is. We ask your blessing as we accept you. We accept you as the Lord, our shepherd. And we thank you that, uh, Lord, just one day we will see you for ourselves and we will be in that forever house forever. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. God bless. We're going to head up to the front. There is a baptism uh, scheduled for 1030. Those who are on Zoom, those on YouTube, uh, there is a the program ongoing and we have a wonderful speaker this morning. God bless you. Uh, you can stay on this YouTube channel. Sorry, you can stay on this Zoom channel. We will continue this after a short pause, but the channel will remain open. And if you want to go on YouTube, you go to the YouTube channel of the Reed Creek SDA Church. God bless you. See you again next week. And for those who are joining us, we should have our divine service and our baptism starting in about five or ten minutes. God bless you. See you soon again.